Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to Rye Presbyterian Church, whether you're with us in person or online. If you are new with us today, we invite you to drop into the church website on the I'm New page and let us know a little bit about yourselves so that we might get to know you better. And let me highlight a couple of things out of the bulletin today, mostly having to do with this day, the youth choir rehearsal going on at 11 o'clock on Zoom. Worship and music committee meets at 11 in the chapel. Gingerbread house pickup this afternoon if you've signed up for that. Confirmation class, just a brief note, both sections of that will be on Zoom today at 3.45 and 5. And then the tree lighting, uh, as it is this year, a little bit differently, will be at 7 o'clock out on the front lawn and on Zoom. Now, do take a look at the uh, announcement about that. We've asked that you register ahead of time if you'd like to come be in person. And do take a look at how we'll be doing that safely together uh, as we welcome the advent of the Christmas season. Uh, beyond that, there's lots in the bulletin to take a look at as we move towards Christmas and the end of the year. Uh, Year-end giving, stewardship reminder of getting your pledges in for the rest or for the coming year. Uh, and then, yes, notes about the Christmas Eve services. There they are, right in there for you. So in your time today, do take a look at the rest of the announcements. Uh, and so let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. On this second Sunday of Advent, we light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. We are preparing ourselves for the days when the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Let us pray. Oh God, on this second Sunday of Advent, we recognize how often we find ourselves overwhelmed by circumstances, stuck in the ditches of various sorts, or given to aimless, meandering on the paths that lead nowhere. And yet you have promised to lift up every valley, straighten the crooked path, and level the mountains in order to come to us and lead us home. 
We hear your promises, O God. Empower us by your spirit to see the way that you've set before us. Empower us as a community of faith to accompany one another on the journey. Help us to listen to each other with compassion and to recognize your tender love that is ever before us. Hear now in the silence of these moments, the ways in which we have wandered from your path, your way this week. Help us to believe the good news of the gospel that we are not left to our own devices, that you have not left us in the ditch or aimlessly wandering in exile, that you have come close in the incarnate Christ, one with a human face who has left a footprint for us to follow and in whose name we pray, amen. Please be seated. I'm still looking forward to that day when we can invite the children here on the steps. We're getting closer. Well, boys and girls, for those of you in the room and those of you at home, hopefully you can see that the sanctuary looks a little different. It's decorated for Christmas now. And in this month, we hear the stories about Jesus' birth from Matthew and from Luke. But Mark, which we're going to hear about today, he starts the story of good news somewhere else. He starts the story of the good news out in the wilderness with a man by the name of John the Baptist. And the Bible tells us he was a woolly kind of man. He wore clothes made out of camel hair, pretty scratchy stuff. He ate locusts and honey, and he had a big leather belt not what we expect to find in the stories about Jesus coming. So the good news in Mark's gospel doesn't come through angels or shepherds or wise men. It comes from the wilderness, from a strange man in a strange place. And so what I want to invite you boys and girls to do this season is even though we're surrounded by the colors and the sounds of Christmas, and even though we will hear the stories of the birth of Jesus from Matthew and Luke, I also want you to watch for the different places that God might bring to us good news, from the different people that God might bring to us to share God's good news. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for John the Baptist, who brings the good news in a different way. Help us to listen for the way that you bring the good news to us. In Jesus' name, amen. A reading from Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. 
Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. The word of the Lord.
Well, surprise, I'm over on this side this week. <laughs> I forgot to mention during the announcements that this is the maiden voyage of our new audio visual system today. You may not be noticing it if you're sitting here, but if you're in this camera right here, you're probably noticing a slightly different view of life. It's nice to be back in the pulpit. It feels really tall up here compared to over there. And so the gospel lesson today comes from the gospel according to Mark in the first chapter. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Again, the word of the Lord. So between last week, John's children's message, you all should ace this little quiz that I'm about to throw your way. So here's a Christmas trivia question for today. Which of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, all up there behind me on either side of Jesus in the main stained glass window, which one of four of those would give us the shortest Christmas pageant ever? Any votes? Matthew, short Christmas pageant. Mark, Luke, John. Okay, okay, okay. We, this is good. We have a little, we should have done this as a poll online to see how our online folks would have done on this. Well, Luke gives us the most, and you guys aced that piece of it. Luke gives us the bulk of the Christmas story, the angel coming to Mary, her visit with her cousin Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, angels appearing, shepherds showing up to find Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. There's a really important comma in that reading. It's not really there because if you read that left text just a little bit wrong. It sounds like all three of them are lying in the manger, Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger uh, instead of Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. That's our second piece of trivia for today. Matthew gives us a genealogy that anchors Jesus in the line of Abraham and in the line of King David. And he gives us a bit of Joseph's perspective on this whole surprising event, as well as the story of the Magi showing up. So a little bit of Matthew for sure in the pageant. John, not so much in the pageant, but we will hear from John on Christmas Eve as John speaks in this soaring poetry of the eternal word of God being made flesh and coming to dwell among us full of grace and truth. But Mark, you guys nailed this one, our gospel text for this coming year, Christmas story, zero, nothing, nothing. As we have heard today, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begins with words from the prophet Isaiah and the appearance of this fascinating figure of John the Baptist. And very soon, actually in verse 9, Jesus is going to appear, but Jesus is going to appear fully grown and ready for work as he comes down to see John and to be baptized in the River Jordan. For Mark, who kind of clips right along throughout all that he writes from one action to the next, what is most important for Mark is not some miraculous origin story or even a royal lineage for Jesus, but that at long last, now, a prophet has appeared one who stands in the tradition of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and Amos and Elijah, maybe most important, one who speaks the truth with clarity and authority, one whose words are drawing a crowd even out there in the wilderness of the Jordan Valley, one who points the people not to himself, but forward, forward to another, forward to God, the God revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. When our group from this church traveled to Israel last February in what seems like an alternative universe, 
we stood right there at the spot on the banks of this river outside east of Jerusalem, on the banks of the Jordan River. And we watched for a long time as pilgrim after pilgrim waded into the waters of the Jordan River to be baptized. But frankly, as rivers go, not terribly impressive. Uh, how wide was the river? Maybe here to the second column away, 15 yards, short, short wedge shot for sure. Um, a bit muddy, frankly, a lot of muddy. It doesn't conjure images of being cleansed to be going into that river terribly much. And exactly, it wasn't exactly convenient to get to either both then or now. From Jerusalem, it's about a 20 mile hike. It'd be like walking from here to the southern end of Central Park. And you just go down a hill. You, Jerusalem is up on top of the hill. You go over the top of it and you go down the valley all the way down to the Jordan River there. 20 miles, 20 miles. But it would make for a tough hike, especially since the journey is through what they call the Judean wilderness, which is a nice term for basically a desert, a wasteland. It is rocky, it is craggy, it is steep, there is no trees, there is no shade to be found. It would be a rough hike out there to the Jordan to see John, and it would be a rougher hike coming back up that hill to get home, especially if you're doing so in wet clothing from being in that river. And yet here he was, 20 miles away from anywhere, drawing a crowd. People coming to hear him speak. People coming to do this act that would become known as baptism. Confessing their sins and dunking in that muddy water. So why? Why would they do that? Why would they be going all the way out there for that? Well, a couple thoughts. Perhaps they sensed it. Perhaps they sensed that a true prophet was in their midst, one who spoke with clarity and power, one who spoke truth, who called out the corruption in the world for what it was, whether it was in the political leaders, Roman or otherwise, people who were using their power only to retain power or to enrich an empire, or religious leaders, religious leaders that frankly in those days looked all too similar to the political leaders self-serving, self-preserving, self-aggrandizing, and failing, failing to bring blessing and hope as they were supposed to, to those in need. So the people turned elsewhere and they hiked a long way to find it. And ironically, maybe they made that trek because John was very clear that it wasn't just those in power who needed confession, who needed to take a good look at themselves and their lives. It was not just someone else who needed to be washed clean, who needed to repent and to turn and to make a fresh start and head in a new direction. Everyone needs to do so then and now. And part of us, part of every single one of us does not want to do that. It does not feel like good news to be told that. And we stop our ears when we hear a prophet speaking our way. But there's a part of us, there's a part of us that does want to hear. A part of us deep down that yearns for truth, that yearns for integrity, that yearns for a life lived well. And maybe that's what resonated for the people. Because in the story of their own ancestors, the wilderness, while challenging and difficult, was also a place to go for clarity. It was a place to go find out who you really are, a place to go meet God and to hear from God, to renew that relationship, that covenant connection with God, and to emerge from that time in the wilderness refreshed and clarified and reinvigorated and focused. The wilderness was a place, as Isaiah says, to go to prepare, to get ready to re-engage with God and with others and with life and with our truest selves. It's a place to go to clear away the accumulated gunk in our lives and in our souls. It's a place to go to fill in, as Isaiah says, the low spots, the potholes in our lives, to smooth down those rough edges and those rough spots and to make ready because God is coming and God is on the way. And new life, this promised hope for the world, it is dawning. And that 
is the good news of the prophets. That is the good news of John the Baptist. And that is the good news coming in Jesus the Christ. That after the wilderness journey, after a time out in the wilderness, whether we've chosen it or whether we've ended up in the wilderness by no choice of our own, by what's gone on in our own lives. After that time in which we may lament and cry out as we talked about last week, or a time when we quietly confess. After we step into those waters and let all of that float away downstream. Psalm 85 says it beautifully. Surely God's salvation is at hand. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. And to quote Isaiah, the grass it withers, flowers as beautiful as they are, they fade. But, but the word of the Lord will last forever. God will come. Mighty, yes, but with a might that shows itself in love and care and a gentle shepherd leading us forward. And so today, today in the distracted busyness of this time of year, in this strange wilderness that is the year 2020, as we come to this table together, may we heed the voice of the one who calls to us from out by that river. May we heed the call to prepare and to make ready, not just to decorate our lives and our homes, but the harder work of clearing a path in our lives and in our hearts of stepping out of our well-known and well-worn ruts that we walk in. And may we hear what we need to hear. The challenge to take a good hard look at ourselves and our ways, to wade into that water, to let go of what we need to release there. To hear the offer, the promise of a new and fresh start, to hear the words of hope on its way. For as John says, one who is more powerful than I is coming. And through him, through the word that stands forever, the glory of the Lord, God's true nature, God's very self will be revealed. Righteousness and peace will kiss. So friends, let's make way. Let's get ready. Let's clear the road. God's steadfast love and whatever faithfulness we can bring, it's time for them to meet. There's a hike ahead of us, but let's go. Amen. Our affirmation of faith today is the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to stand with me as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And now for our minute for mission, I invite Deacon and Mission and Outreach Committee member Allison Reynolds to come forward. Good morning. The Christmas Joy offering has been a cherished Presbyterian tradition since the 1930s. The offering distributes the gifts equally to the assistance program of the Board of Pensions and to the Presbyterian related schools and colleges, equipping communities of color. By supporting the assistance program of the Board of Pensions, the Christmas Joy offering honors the faithfulness of current and retired church workers and their families in need. 
These generous actions bear witness to our faithful response to God's charge to love one another as Christ commanded. Gifts received in 2019 helped to provide. Income supplements that helped nearly 311 households, assisting retired church workers and surviving spouses with the means to provide for themselves. Housing supplements that helped more than 249 households, households remain in their homes, afford assisted living and long-term care. Shared and emergency grants that helped more than 84 households facing times of great financial need or uncertainty due to unforeseen circumstances. The PCUSA has a historic commitment to higher learning and has long promoted education and leadership development through the establishment and support of Presbyterian related schools and colleges equipping communities of color. Our future church leaders of color can receive much needed assistance while they discover and pursue their professional goals at these schools and colleges. Gifts received in 2019 were used to provide education and leadership development schools at Presbyterian related schools and colleges, support for the Menal School in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a school that looks to develop excellence, confidence and integrity and provide the foundation for lifelong learning and ethical leadership. The Presbyterian Pan American School in Kingsville, Texas, a school that educates and empowers young adults for leadership in this global community. And Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which is committed to fostering academic excellence, to providing opportunities for diverse populations, and to maintaining a strong tradition of preparing students for leadership and service by fostering experiential learning and community engagement. By giving to the Christmas Joy offering, you honor God's gift of Jesus Christ. To share your offerings and gifts this morning, if you're watching online, you are invited to use the link that can be found in the bulletin. For those of you here in the sanctuary, offering plates are located at the rear doors as you leave worship this morning. Thank you for your gifts. Friends, as we prepare to come to the table, if you are at home, we invite you to gather your communion elements that you'll be using for this worship service. And if you're in the sanctuary today, you'll note that we have a different form of communion here. And just so you know, the bread is in the bottom of the chalice and you can peel that off. And then when you're ready, you can peel off the top and drink of it. Friends, this is the joyful feast of God's people. Men, women, boys, and girls, they shall come from north, south, east and west to sit at the table in God's kingdom. This is not a Presbyterian table. It is a table that belongs only to our Lord and Savior. And so we invite all to come, partake, taste and see and know the goodness of God this day. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Great Deliverer, how wondrous are your deeds. You created the world and all that is in it. With a mighty arm, you parted the waters and you led your people to liberation. When we were in exile, you gathered us up in your arms and led us home. When we were mistreating our own, you sent prophets to set us right. You pulled down the arrogant and lifted up the weak. And when the time was right, you sent Jesus to set us free. Therefore, we praise you joining the everlasting chorus of all creation and the great company of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In Jesus, you blessed us as never before. We thank you for the ways he taught us in word and deed, how he fed us in homes and on hillsides, healed us in body, mind, and soul, and showed us that true greatness is in humility and true power in service. How can we thank you for the gift he gave? When the world did its worst, he took on our death that we might be clothed in light and life. So with gratitude and expectation, 
we remember that Jesus took bread, blessed, broke, and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body given for you. So also we remember that Jesus took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant of love and grace poured out for you and for many. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, as we wait for him to come again, O God, stir up your power and restore us. Make us to be your word made flesh. Send your Holy Spirit to infuse us with hope in the great mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. All glory and honor are yours, eternal God, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we partake in the bread, for this is the bread of life, broken for us. And we partake in the cup, as it is the cup of the new covenant. Let us partake. Together, let us join in the prayer of thanksgiving. God, our hope, we give you thanks that you have given us this foretaste of your new creation. Strengthen us with this heavenly food as we seek to serve you in word and deed. Lead us to live in joyful expectation of the coming again in glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Friends, the way of the Lord is before us, and it may be rugged, but let us make our way together in faith and in faithfulness. And as we do so, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the promise of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen. Amen.